Good morning. It's Tuesday, February 3rd, 2015. This is Tech Talk Today, episode 127, if your face can believe that. My name is Chris, and uh, we got a show that's littered with stories that managed to somehow poke through all of the Super Bowl noise. And whenever a show or whenever a story manages to survive that onslaught, I think it means it's worth talking about right here on the Tech Talk Today program. And to help me talk about those stories is our well-equipped mumble room. Time appropriate greetings, mumble room. Hey, you. Hello, Hello guys. Hi. Blood. Hi. Hello. What up? Hi. Uh, so it, it is uh, Spazzy C in the chat room tells me we're on, we're on episode 126 right now. But I'm telling you, I did a special check with the back office before we started, and I can guarantee you this is actually supposed to be 126 and not 127. So this is Tech Talk Today 126. You know, it doesn't matter, right? They're just numbers. What's a number mean? It don't mean uh, a thing, well, right? <laughs> it, it wouldn't be a proper tech talk today if we didn't mess up the It numbers. does seem to happen about once a week. I think it's because it's it daily. Least, yeah. And my, my whole brain is built around weekly shows, and it doesn't make any sense if something can happen so often. Uh, all right, so let's talk about something that nobody cares about that doesn't mean it's not a big deal and is probably not actually what's happening. Uh, Google is developing its own Uber Destroyer. Uh, this is according to a bunch of different articles, but Bloomberg got the exclusive. Bloomberg, Bloomberg ran the story saying the two companies are about to start competing and Google, this is coming from the Google Ventures arm, so they suspect may be willing to use self-driving cars. Now what's interesting about this is Google Ventures previously, a few years ago, invested $258 million into Uber. So Google is an Uber investor and supposedly Google has m- sent notice to Uber that they'll be working on a service like this. Uh, these are uh, the. This is all information coming from people that are familiar with folks on Uber's board. So Google's going to enter the ride-sharing market, compete with Uber, and one day possibly integrate self-driving cars. Google just gets in, is competing with everybody these days. Uh, I. I, I'm 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 somebody who's sort of like w- kind of waiting to see where all of this goes. I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical of all this of all of this. Uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, says that uh, is that it might not be as big of a deal as everybody's making it out to be. So the Wall Street Journal is sort of reporting on the Bloomberg article, saying, "Well, it's going to start small, and probably with just Google employees initially. It's going to be for a carpool system for Google employees." to get to work initially. So it's not the Uber killer that Bloomberg is reporting. The Wall Street Journal says, slow down, slow down. Everybody who's freaking out about Google creating the next Uber, take it down a notch. They're just talking about creating the next awesome carpool system for their employees. Anyone in the mumble room have thoughts about Google entering Uber? And keep in mind too, Google, let's say they start with the employee thing, but do eventually roll it out. Now you've got Google that's competing with Uber. You have Google that's competing with like Amazon Fresh and Amazon Local, the delivery service. Google wants to get into local delivery services. I mean, they're getting into a lot of online marketplaces and competing with people. Does anybody in the mumble room have any thoughts about any of this? So I was... Go ahead. Go ahead, Bobby. You go first. I was in uh, Brussels uh, over the weekend at, at Fosdem, and uh, one of my friends was using Uber. And in the centre of Brussels, they have uh, a lot of public transport. There's taxis, there's uh, trams, there's buses, there's trains, and everything. And I, I I've seen the videos of uh, Google's automated hmm. cars working in the big, wide, slow, open streets of America. In European cities, not so much. Right. And so I, I. Yes, it, it'd be something for Uber to worry about in the future, but I don't think it's coming anytime soon. They just, they, it just doesn't matter. The self-driving part, Silicon Valley, right now. Right, yeah. I, I totally agree. I could see Google uh, rolling out with people in there initially, and and you know, Google would take if Google had to put a driver in that car, they would probably put Wi-Fi sensors in there, GPS trackers, like cameras. Right, I mean, Google would make the most out of. They would make those things mobile sensors, which is kind of an interesting idea to see what they could do there. Uh, and but, maybe even free free internet for the passenger in the car. Oh, wouldn't wouldn't that be interesting? Why wouldn't they? Right? If they could, if they yeah. could afford, if they could make that work. Oh, I like that idea. Uh, that would make a. You know what? Honestly, just thinking about it, like if I'm here and I have the option to ordering a Google car or an Uber car, I probably would be more inclined to go with a Google car, especially especially if I had internet access. Uh, that would be a slam dunk if I can get on Wi Fi. Oh. You know, one thing I'm thinking is that. Google is going to break into this whole uh, automated car market and actually make it start going. That's going to be how they're going to do it. 
So right, you know, wouldn't that be that probably makes a lot of sense? The, how you roll out self-driving cars is you don't you don't sell the public on replacing everybody's you know uh, car because cars are extremely expensive. People are, have multi. You make it a service first, right? Yeah. You you introduce it that way. People get experience with it as a service, and then well, why not have one of these at home one day? That's a, that is exactly that's a long play. This is a really smart long play when you think about it like that. Uh, and I, yeah, so, that's kind of where I was thinking about I, that. I agree, so, though, with Popey. I think it's way further off than any of us think it is. So are you suggesting that oh, yeah. people would uh, change their own car for a Google car, and then when, they, when they're using it, when they, when they want to actually um, make money, they use their car as a Google car? Yeah, maybe. Rather than, yeah. And then oh, use someone else's possible. when they're in another city. Maybe, yeah. So, hmm. I was picturing it something like where Ange and I right now, my wife and I, we have two cars. Uh, and I, I, you know, for the, for the short term, I can't really see that changing, especially with three kids, but, uh, I could see a future where a a couple maybe only needs to have one car. And when the other has to get around, they just call a Google or an Uber car. Like I could start to see that's how self-driving cars could work their way into your lifestyle is, uh, you know, cause I could be here and could have the one vehicle driving all around. And if I'm just going to be at the studio all day, well, why not just have a Google self-driving car drop me off and pick me up? And I could just schedule right. it online. I mean, ooh, that's and it, it's it's only breeders like you and me that have that problem. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's true. I know. See, a lot of people could just get around on their bike. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is this is a fun one to speculate about. We'll see. We'll see where it goes. I agree. Now, of course, Popey, I don't know if you've driven around San Francisco before. Uh, yes. Yeah, actually. those are pretty twisty roads. So I mean, they they get the, they have the cars driving on in San Francisco. So there's hope. There is hope. But we'll see. I think it's like, I agree with you. I think it's way, way off. You know what's kind of sad? And I, I don't know if, uh, is Radio Shack a thing outside of the U.S.? Pope, have you heard of Radio Shack before? It, in the U.K., it was um, Tandy. Okay. Oh, but, uh, oh, oh, okay. They, 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 don't, they don't exist anymore. I think all the stores shut. Or yeah, well. Or they were bought by a, f- a, phone, a, mo- a mobile phone company and rebranded. Yeah, well, so Radio Shack here in the U.S. is in talks to sell half its stores to Sprint and then shut down the rest of the stores. Maybe sell a few to Amazon as well. So Amazon might consider getting into the retail game by buying up some of the Radio Shack spaces here in the U.S. to show off, uh, like, the flyer gadgets and stuff like that. Uh, I, for me, you know, I don't go to Radio Shack anymore, but for some reason I still can't feel a little, I can't help but feel a little sad, a little uh, nostalgic about Radio Shack. There was definitely a time where Radio Shack played an important ri- uh, part. It was the only place in in this sort of podunk town that I live in to get anything of the sort like this and, uh, you know, wires, batteries, everything adapters as far as i'm concerned still is the only place where you can really get actual components electronic components well you know for me unfortunately uh, for the most of the stuff that i got from radio shack i now get from monoprice or amazon oh yeah there's that too yeah Yeah, and i think that really kind of killed radio shack for me and the thing is they just have you know radio shack couldn't have the with the selection these online guys could we had radio shacks in india also really are they still there we had radio shack in india also and it's yeah, and it's no, it's still a business that's open. Ago. Oh 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 okay okay. Well, that's too bad. Um, yeah, I guess I guess you know these things happen. End of an era, you know. It's one of those things. Tandy really had the worst trouble. My mom used to work for Tandy back in the day, and yeah, they just could not. They they were just in financially deep trouble. They could not change their business model, and when they tried changing their business model, they turned into a horrible place to work. And mm. Yeah, it's I've seen horror stories on the internet about working in radio, for Radio Shack. And uh, Spazzy, yeah, my oh, go ahead, Bobby. Sorry, my uh, my wife uh, worked in Radio Shack. Oh, uh, really? Candy, like yeah, it was one of her like Saturday jobs, I think. And uh, she's not technical at all, and she hated it, absolutely hated it, because she didn't understand a thing that was going on around her. Right, well, that was a common problem they had, is they hired people that didn't really have, that was one of the problems that I had with Radio Shack, is you go in there and they didn't know, you couldn't ask them questions, because they didn't know the answers to the things. Right. Um, Which is funny, because their slogan for the longest time was, you've got questions, we've got answers. Yeah, oh, right! <laughs> Gosh, no kidding. <laughs> Spazzy C, you are our, our local Canadian reporter, can you give us the uh, Canadian uh, Radio Shack report? Well, um, I don't know actually how long ago now, but yeah, we had Radio Shack. I don't know if it was just a Canadian arm of the same thing, but it had the same logos. But they all got um, sold at the exact same time, and all their names changed to become The Source. Oh, yes. Yeah, The Source, it's interesting. So Radio Shack in the U.S. sold Tandy computers, and Radio Shack in the U.S. had a substore inside it called The Source. Yes, I remember that. Yeah, that's funny. It's funny how they do these things. They 
They just bend over backwards to make this stuff work. Uh, so there's a story of failure, right? Obviously, uh, you, you might, if you recall back into the uh, crevices of your of your Apple rumor mind. I know there's so many; it's hard to keep them all straight. But you guys might remember about this whole sapphire plant that uh, had a deal with Apple to make sapphire glass for the new iPhones. They couldn't put their big boy pants on and get the job done. And Apple wrote a hard deal that they signed on the dotted line for and basically rode them into the ground. They shut down. We didn't get Sapphire Glass on the iPhones and they, this company didn't get business. Uh, and it was kind of a bit of a bit of a mess because they got drug into public. Some court documents came out. We, find, we found out how much Apple fines these people for releasing information about upcoming products. Lots of really dirty details came out. And uh, now, at the end of all of that, it appears that Apple is going to take that failed Sapphire plant and turn it into a data center, which is kind of an interesting approach for a company to take when you have something that's not a data center at all. It's a Sapphire plant and convert it into a data center, which I'm not really sure what that process would look like, but uh, it's a 1.3 million... equipment. <laughs> yeah, right? Computers. I mean, I'm sure it has good power. I mean, I would, or cooling. I don't know, but I don't know. Well, it'd have to have good power. I mean, as far yeah. as cooling, yeah. Uh, 1.3 million square foot building, and uh, yeah, I don't know. It, uh, it's kind of funny. I guess you know, what, the reason why I wanted to call this story out is what it underscores to me is... Um, how dynamic this data center thing is becoming in the U.S. This is so. There's a website called Data Center Knowledge that tracks this fairly well, and uh, one of the things, and I track it for TechSnap. And one of the things that I've noticed is that companies like Google, Microsoft, and Apple, and Amazon, actually, the, the mo mostly those companies right now, are taking any buildings they can get that are big enough and flipping them and turning them into data centers. And in some cases, they're even turning them into temporary data centers. It's 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 a really interesting thing that's going. It's like there's a mad rush for data center space, and so. Apple converting this failed Sapphire plant is an interesting move. Okay, all right. This is a little U.S.-centric today. I'm sorry about this, Popey, uh, and everybody else. But one last uh, U.S.-centric story, and then we'll get out of the U.S. stuff. Uh, this is an interesting one to follow. We've been we've been watching the net neutrality stuff, and there's going to be some big announcements around that very soon, which we will cover here on Tech Talk today. Lots of rumors and uh, signaling that the FCC commissioner is going to uh, try to go for uh, Title II for net neutrality. Uh, but before we get to that, that's not actually been officially announced yet. What has been announced is the FCC wants to override state laws where they shut down municipal Wi-Fi. So there's some areas in the U.S. where uh, the community wants to come together and set up a community Wi-Fi. So that way you have ubiquitous Internet in the town. And a lot of times what happens is big telcos come in and they sort of lobby the local government to prevent it. And they even get laws passed. And so the FCC chief wants to override those at a federal level at the, at the states and sort of normalize the municipal Wi-Fi laws across the states. I don't know if it's going to be normalized to a good way or not, but that seems to be what's happening, which could, which could have the net effect of opening up a lot more free Wi-Fi access points. Um, around the place. So this could be a good thing. We'll see what happens. I'm still really nervous about the whole yeah. uh, net neutrality stuff. It's still, I think there's a lot of cons to Title II. I want to say the state of Spokane actually tried that and it didn't end up going anywhere. I bet you for the exact same reasons Comcast probably lobbied yeah. and, in I mean, the state some, legislature. And there's some successful it. stories for sure. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, it's, it's, it's such a hodgepodge here in the U.S. Uh, it's basically everybody, uh, everybody for, their, for their own. And uh, if one place decides to set up an access point for free and another place decides to set up an access point and you have to pay or whatever, it's, it, it, there's, no, there's no standard, standard to it. And if it, maybe, I, maybe I'm – what do I know? I mean I'm just some dumb podcaster. But if, if, I, if I had a city and I – like say Seattle or, or maybe even there's some nice, very unique, um, eclectic towns here in the Pacific Northwest. Like uh, one that's coming to mind right now is La Conner. Eric, you probably know La Conner, oh, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, La very – gorgeous. Gorgeous, eclectic, high-end town that's really just kind of meant for traveling into tourism. Oh yeah. Uh, if I was LaConnor, I would, I would, I, it would be a no-brainer to have a town-wide Wi-Fi. It's not a very big town, and it is such a value add to the already high-end customers that are coming there that it's, it's, it's just, it seems obvious. But there's laws literally in place in our area that prevent them from doing that. It's just crazy. Yep. More internet's for everybody. Yeah. You know what else everybody exactly. needs more of? Smartwatches. Uh, Pebble is reporting that they've sold more than one million smartwatches. They have big updates coming, and uh, they say they have something brand new they're working on. Pebble is, I don't know, still my watch to, to watch. But I'm bummed. <laughs> they say we found a new framework to use an interaction model on the watch. This is according to the CEO telling The Verge. And that adding apps won't be the main focus of the platform. It doesn't look like what we have today, and it doesn't look like what's on your smartphone. 
So a new way yeah. to interact with the device and a non-app centric model. What does that it's mean? It's one of those things where it's basically just an extension of your technology. In this case, like your phone or something, and not so much its own device. It needs something else in order to display that, and I think that's a great idea. I want one. And did you know that Telegram has built-in functionality to integrate with the Pebble Watch? So there you no, go. No, I did not know this. Yeah. Oh, nice. it's yeah. game changer. Yeah. So uh, I, I kind of want one really bad, but uh, I don't know. Seems like now's the bad time to buy a smartwatch. I say good for Pebble. I like that they're not sitting around. They're 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 responding. They also claim that uh, 2014 was a big staffing year for them. And uh, that they have positioned themselves to take decisive action in 2015. I don't know what that means exactly, uh, but I will watch it. Anybody have thoughts on Pebble before we wrap up? Just that I like the way that they're going, that they're not focusing on the apps, that it's more an extension of the phone. And I, I look at a smartwatch more for like notifications and stuff mm. than for the apps. Mm hmm. That's what I want from uh, a smartwatch. Right. And, and if you think about it, now I could, I could, I could, I'm totally willing to eat my words later. I'm not. I'm not predicting. I'm just saying before owning a smartwatch, to me, it seems sort of like the same problem I have with apps on my TV. Uh, for the first six to nine, eight, maybe even a year, if I'm lucky, of owning that device, the apps are pretty solid and they probably even get some updates. However, the, 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 just the science behind making devices that compact, that small means they will never, ever, ever, ever be as fast as your smartphone. The smartphone will always get more processing power, more memory, larger screens, better antennas, better battery life. The smartphone will always be a better device, always, because of the technology involved. It's not because it's, it's not as miniature, right? So I the smartphone will always be kind of the slower thing. And I'm not sure that's where I want a bunch of apps. I am some kind of OCD son of a bitch, and I cannot stand any lag, any latency. If Noah was here, he'd tell you that when I started working on this on uh, on this TV that we have here with the smart UI on it, I I, I just I, I I'm not, I'm not like I just do not handle slaggy UIs very well. To me, it seems like they've crashed. It's just not. It's no good. It's no good. And I don't want that on my watch. So if Pebble's going to come up with something that is not so app centric, that maybe is just pulling data from my much more powerful computer in my pocket. That might be something I'm more on board with. That's a, it, it reminds me of flavor flavors of the Apple Watch without having to have the Apple Watch. And the thing I still love about the Pebble, A, runs Linux, and B, works with Android or iOS devices, which I like that flexibility too. Well, the other thing is, if you look at things like the, the Apple Watch, um, doesn't don't the apps actually run on the phone? Yeah. And you, you know... You project, so basically. Te yeah, technically, if you've got the super powerful phone, then that's mitigated the problem of having a very low power, you know, low resource uh, right. device on your wrist because it's not actually running there. So uh, I, I, so I wonder if Pebble's going to have new hardware. I just want. Oh, I'm I'm fighting it because I just don't. I just do not have. I'm just. I don't have the money to just go buy smartwatches, especially for one that I don't. Especially since it's like that. I'm not a big watch person. I while I, while I was at Fosdem, uh, I uh, I saw one of the Open Sousa guys and uh, noticed he had the Motorola uh, one, Moto 360. Yeah, yeah. And having never seen one in the flesh, I suddenly really, really want one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm getting there. I'm getting there too. How how is the screen on the Moto? Because I can see an LCD being hard to like see in the sunlight and stuff. That's what I like about the Pebbles with the e ink. Yeah, the e ink is appealing, well, isn't it? To, to be fair, I only saw it in a bar that was dark. I didn't actually mm. see it outside. But, you know, it, it just looked amazing. I, I, yeah, I'm coveting that. Uh, all right. Well, if I ever get one, I'll, I'll tell you all about it. I'm curious to hear more about Fosdem. Uh, but we should, probably, uh, we should probably bring this episode to a close. So we'll have links to stuff we talked about in the show notes. techtalktoday.reddit.com is where you can go to make this show better. Give us your feedback, links. And uh, today at jupiterbroadcasting.com is where you email us. Also, even though you probably hate it, reviews and stars and stuff on iTunes, for those of you who do use it, helps other people find the show. Uh, and uh, I want to mention the Patreon. We, you know, Because it's the end of the month and cards get charged, uh, people, who, uh, people who have failed to get charged for a few times in a row get bumped off. So we did actually breach 440 uh, for a couple of days, but then once the clearing process came through, we dropped down to 435. So here's why I mentioned that. Uh, very soon. I'm just trying to make sure I, I'm, I get really anxious about updating the milestones because then I feel like it's a big, huge commitment. And if I anyways, what wh what I'm trying to get to is a new milestone structuring on the Patreon page over at patreon.com slash today to help us afford the relaunch of how to Linux, because we're going to pay uh, the production staff for working on that just because I think that's fair. But uh, um, 
we could use your help to afford that over at patreon.com slash today. It's a pledge. It's a monthly pledge system. You go there uh, as much as you can afford. There is some higher tier levels like the swag club level. We just sent out uh, Jupiter Broadcasting mouse pads to our swag club level uh, last week. So if you're in there, make sure you check your mailbox. Patreon.com slash today. Go over there and help us fund future projects of the Jupiter Broadcasting Network like How To Linux. Patreon.com slash today. We'd love to get that up to 440 again this week since we dropped down to 435 over the weekend. Patreon.com slash today. Also, by the way, that uh, subreddit, techtalktoday.reddit.com, great place to put old videos that are like, you know, 30 seconds to a minute long that are just awesome retro tech videos. Please submit them there. Even if it's not a news story, I'd take those too. Uh, and today... We're going to take a little educational trip in our ending video. Uh, there's this brand new future platform that's amazing, lots of great technology, and there's only one man who's fully qualified to introduce it to us. He's here, he's got a green screen, and he's about to give us a glimpse of the future. Thanks for joining me today. See you tomorrow, everybody, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, jblive.tv. Hello. I'm Bill Gates, Chairman of Microsoft. In this video, you're going to see the future, Windows. Microsoft first came up with the Windows concept back in 1983. And today, the leading software users have switched into the Windows environment. It's really incredible how quickly our powerful applications like Word and Excel and PowerPoint have been adopted. It's not just Microsoft applications. Even companies like WordPerfect and Lotus have now come out with Windows applications. And every week we see new innovative work. It's really attracting all the innovation in the industry. We predicted this a long time ago. And now it's the future. Let's take a look. <laughs> 